have come for divine outpouring of the love and power of God. For a supernatural unspeakable anointing. We've come for a continuous revival. We've come for the power of God to saturate the penitent. And of course, we will find a solace here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for this retreat. We thank you for all the arrangement that has gone on before this time so that everyone can be here. We thank you for the faithfulness of our overseers. We thank you because of the courage of our workers. And we thank you, Lord, because of the preparation in every side that you have granted us to make. We thank you, Lord, because today we have seen the result of how you have gathered us together to bless us. And we know we are here for a purpose. And Lord, we pray that that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that we'll find Jesus Christ a true friend, a true savior, a true supporter, a true supplier of all our needs in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that this retreat will be a time of refreshing, a time of renewal, a time of transformation in all our lives in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that all your ministers you will use, either in singing or in preaching, either as we are together here in a combined plenary session in the whole congregation, or seminar by seminar, Father, we pray your anointing will be mighty upon every one of our preachers and ministers in Jesus' name. That, Lord, you will use every word we hear, every song we hear, everything that is done to lead us to the place you want to bring us in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that there will be no hindrance, there will be no interruption to our hearing from you and getting the best from you in Jesus' name. We pray that the blood of Jesus will cover our hearts, will protect us, will preserve us, so there will be a direct communication between us and our Lord in Jesus' name. We pray we will not see men, we will see God. We pray we will not allow any distraction, but Lord, your word will find a place in every heart, in every life, in Jesus' name. Reveal yourself to us. Lead us into the fountain of living waters. And grant us, Lord, that we may have this bread of life, this water of life, and feed us until we are satisfied in Jesus' name. As we come, Lord, we come with all our problems, believing that in this retreat, spiritual problems and other kinds of problems, by your power, by your might, you roll everything away in Jesus' name and make us better children of God, better ministers of the gospel, better soul winners, that as we go back to all our villages and towns and cities and localities, we pray, oh Lord, that a new anointing, a new power, a new understanding, a new zeal, a new vision will be seen in every one of us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're looking at verses 28 and 29. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 28 and 29 and Eliab his oldest brother heard when he spake unto the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and he said why camest thou thou hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down 
that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? The two verses I've read to you are taken from something that happened in the life of David when he was yet unknown by the king of Israel, when he was yet unknown by the general population of the children of Israel. The two verses I've read to you happened as an event in the life of David when his brothers had not yet known the value of the anointing that received in the earlier chapter. And when they had not known the outcome of the power, the Spirit of God coming upon him. Those two verses I read to you come out of the story in the life of David. When even though Saul had met David before in chapter 16, but it was a kind of meeting that didn't leave a lasting impression upon Saul because Saul himself had been troubled by an evil spirit. And he called in young David to come and play the harp. And he played the harp and Saul was refreshed. But because of the confusion in the mind of Saul, and because of the insanity that had come upon him, although he loved him that he had ministered unto him, yet he did not know the future plan of God for this young man that had played the harp. The two verses I read to you upon at a time in the history of the life of David when David himself, although he had been anointed to become king, and although he had played the harp and he had seen the miraculous wonder in the palace of King Saul. And although before this time he had been enabled by the Lord, energized by the Lord, to kill a lion and to kill a bear, yet he himself did not know what the next 40 years will look for him as a young man. He didn't know what it will mean as the Lord was going to lead him stage by stage and step by step. And yet... The Lord orchestrated everything and planned everything without David or Jesse or Eliab or Saul or any of the children of Israel knowing what actually was taking place. Now, the reason why this is peculiarly true about every one of us is that as there was a battle raging at that time for the whole nation of Israel. So you know, there is a battle raging for the nation in which we live. And as there was no conclusion before David came as to where the battle will end, because, you know, for weeks and for days, Goliath had been putting his feet on the ground, and he had been saying this, this, this. Give me a man. And the children of Israel had been wondering, is there a man? And there was somebody that was tall, taller than everyone. He would have been the man that would have come out to challenge Goliath. But he was shaking. He was not able to. And of all the tribes of the children of Israel, they looked for a man. There was no man. And you see the condition in which we are at present. That we're saying all we need is a man. But then we're saying, where is the man? And you know, in the south, in the north, where is the man? And in this state of confusion, David came. And as he came to them, now they didn't know that the solution was in their hand. And if we now went to the newspapers, and we just told them that in all this confusion in which we are, the solution, we found a young brother here. We found a young sister here. Ask him. He has connection with heaven. He has connection with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The solution it is, it is in his hand. Write it down. The newspapers will send us back to Ayobo. They will say, you don't know what you are talking about. Eliab will confront us and say, what are you doing here? I know the pride of your heart. I know the fanaticism of you people. I know the assumption of you people, gospelers. That feel that the solution is in your hand. 
And then in that situation, did David say, What have I done now by myself? What have I done in human pride? What have I done in human strategy? What have I done that you are accusing me of? I find myself here. Is there not a cause? As you come from far away states and regions and local governments and cities, it is likely that if your relatives knew that you are coming to Lagos at such a time like this, they will be asking you, who have you left that shop in, in his hand? And uh, those uh, children, your own children, that you know the trouble you got before you got them, who did you leave them with? Young man, you just married. And this time you've traveled down to Lagos. You say that you are going for workers retreat. Who have you left your new wife uh, to? And then they'll be saying that new job you just got. You know the situation now. Because if you are careless now with anything you have. You know what's going to happen. Who have you left that job? Uh, in whose son have you left that job? And uh, why will you be so foolish? Why will you be so ignorant? Why will you be so fanatical? Why will you be so religious as to say you are going for a workers retreat now? That's what he told David. And David said, do you think I'm here because I want to be here? Do you think I'm here because I'm inquisitive? Do you think I'm here because I'm fanatical? What have I done that the Lord has not led me to do? What have I done that there is not a witness in my heart, in my conscience, that this is the place I ought to be now? I don't know all the reasons why I'm here, but I know I'm here for a purpose. I don't know everything that heaven has planned, but I know I'm here for a purpose. I do not know the result of every prayer I will pray, every stone I will throw. In fact, when I was coming, I brought along my sling that I used to use, that I was using in clear rats and rabbits. I don't even know what uh, it will be used for, but I know there is something in my heart telling me I'm here for a purpose. And as people ask you, why is it? It is at this time. At this time of uncertainty. That you will take the vehicle and come down south and come to a place like this. You say, I don't know. But there is something in my heart telling me this is the right time to be in this place. There is something in my heart telling me that there is a cause. And I will discover that cause as I go on. And so David told, he looked at his brother. He said, you rebuke me. For what I believe I'm not guilty of. That I've let the little sheep. I've left everything behind. I've gone all that long journey. And I've come to this place right now. Eliab, wait and see. Is there not a cause? You see many things that happen in our lives. They may be arranged by human beings. You see, Jesse arranged this. He never knew about Goliath. I mean, Jesse back in Bethlehem. That called his son David. And he said, David, come. Take these little things. And take to your brothers that are on the battlefield. And when you get there... Give them this and ask how things are going on and then come back. He didn't know that God was using him to make an arrangement. That through that arrangement, his own son, his little boy, his young David, will kill the champion of the Philistines. When he heard the story later, he must have then understood that sometimes... Divine purposes are achieved through human arrangement. Sometimes, divine purposes are achieved through human arrangement. Now, think about this uh, workers' retreat. You know, in this workers' retreat, what you just said is that your overseer said that uh, we've been informed from the headquarters of Deeper Life in Lagos that there is going to be a retreat, workers retreat and since our workers begin to prepare 
Why at this time? Look at it. In fact, to be able to pay house rent, those people in Lagos, they don't understand the, situ the financial situation. And the transportation now to go from, to come from far north to far south. Don't they know the high cost? And our wives that have just delivered babies that were prayed for for a long time. And we do not want them to take the uh, transportation by road. If they are going to go to that uh, Lagos by air, don't they know that things are multiplied? The insecurity of job, once you ask for a week off, because this time it is even from Tuesday to Saturday. And uh, that means the whole week is gone. Don't they know that if you take a week out of your time, it is as well as saying, employers, bye-bye, when I come, I look for another job. What kind of arrangement is this? Would you remember, please, sometimes divine purposes are achieved through human arrangement. It was a human arrangement here that brought David to the battlefield. And it seems like, it seems like a, a human arrangement that brought you from your regions and localities and brought you to the headquarters church. But is there not a cause? Number two, divine provision through absolute surrender. Divine provision through absolute surrender. Here were the children of Israel. They were looking for who will challenge Goliath. And for 40 days, the man will come out and he will challenge uh, all the armies of the children of Israel. And you know the children of Israel, the one reason why they chose a king is that they said, choose us a king. Who will be able to go before us into battle like all the other nations? Now Samuel had chosen for them a king. He had gone before them into battle and yet... When Goliath challenged the army of Israel, there was nobody that came out. And yet, God provided a young man, a David. And as he came out, it was because of his absolute surrender. Here you are, without surrender of your will, of your thoughts. Of the temptations, of, of the things that came into your mind, saying, Will you go? You are going to yield your life to the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, God will protect, there is no problem at all. Hey, but all those things we read about in that paper, in that paper, in that paper, it appears that there's turbulence down south in Lagos. Well, the Lord will see us through. There is an arrangement. I surrender my life into the hands of the Lord. And that's how you are here. Divine provision through absolute surrender. Number three, divine power through persevering prayer. Those are the three points we're going to consider. Number one, divine purpose in human arrangement. Number two, divine provision through absolute surrender. Number three, divine power through persevering prayer. I pray that during this retreat, divine power divine provision, divine purpose will be revealed to every one of us in Jesus' name. Now you see, here we find young David. And young David yielded his life. It was this divine purpose being fulfilled. Even though the young man did not know everything that will come out of it, yet he gave himself into the hands of the Lord. And as we have taken that first step, that you are taking the journey and you have come over here for this retreat i believe and i pray that you will never be the same again in jesus name now we look at verse 29 again which is first samuel chapter 17 verse 29 and david said what have i now done is there not a cause is there not a reason why we are here? Did David know all the reasons why he came? No, he did not. Do you know all the reasons 
why you are here? No, you don't. The purpose that Jesse had in mind, it was a good purpose to go and see how the promise of God is being fulfilled that no man shall be able to stand before the children of Israel. Go and see, David, whether that promise of the Lord is already being fulfilled concerning the children of Israel. That's a good purpose. The purpose that you will go and see, the preservation of your three brothers that have gone, of their lives that have gone into the battlefield. That's a good purpose to go and see. The preservation of the life of his own senior brothers who had gone into the battlefield. The purpose in the mind of Jesse to see as the king in his outing, since that was the desire of the children of Israel, choose a king for us who will go before us to battle, to go and see, go and see David and come back to tell me how King David, the choice of the people, how he is overcoming the Philistines. And he's getting the victory. And it was a good purpose that our overseers had in mind. When they announced to you that we will be going to the headquarters, we'll be going to the workers' retreat, and they encouraged you and challenged you, and, and they said, you know, it comes only once in a while. And it's very important we go and see the headquarters once again. How things are going on. I think that's a good purpose. And also to go and see how the gospel is marching on. How the word of God is moving on. I think that's a good purpose. But then look at the purpose that God had in mind. And although the words of David were prophetic. Very, very prophetic. Is there not a cause? I am here. Is there not a cause? Although those words were very prophetic, but like it happened in the Old Testament, many of the prophets of old did not know the depth and the height, the breadth and the length of the prophecies that they gave. The same thing with David. Although his words were very prophetic, is there not a cause? He did not know the depth and the height and the length and the breadth of the prophecy that he gave out when he said, I know there is a cause. I know there is a reason why I am here. Now, what were the causes? So many, I don't know whether I can exhaust them. Number one, the purpose of the Lord in making that human arrangement for David to be there on the battlefield is to see, number one, God on the moon and God at work. You see, the nation of Israel had not seen the power of God, the manifestation, the moving of the power of God. And then God wanted the children of Israel to see, and the Philistines to see, and the Philistines to remember that the same victory that God had for the children of Israel, when Moses was alive, when Joshua was alive, when some of the judges were chosen by God, the Lord wanted the people to see that that God is still the same. That his power had not changed. And there was nobody. God did not find anyone at his own heart that he could use and move through. So that they will be able to see his power. And therefore he arranged. Without making an announcement that he was the one arranging it. He arranged and sent David there so that Israel and the Philistines will see God at work. Number two. To defeat the champion enemy against Israel. Uh, David might not have known that. When Jesse called him. When he answered. When he, does, when he took those little things. When he was taking a step at a time going to the battlefield. When he came near the battleground of the children of Israel against the Philistines. He might not have known that he was the person to defeat the champion enemy against the Israelites. Do you know, young sister? Do you know, young brother? If you are the one that will defeat the champion enemy against your family from generation to generation until this time. Do you know whether the hindrance in evangelization in your region 
although you may not even be a region overseer do you know whether you are the one that is going to defeat the champion enemy resisting the preaching of the gospel there do you know whether you are the one the instrument of god that the enemy the devil that had been hindering people to progress spiritually whether you are the one to defeat that champion enemy did he know he didn't know but he knew there is a cause for being here and you may not know the reason you are here but it's a cause for you being here number three it was to taste god's power and demonstrate his supremacy here david came and you know he wasn't prepared for this he didn't know that's why he was there but he was there to demonstrate the supremacy of god and to demonstrate the power of god and i believe that god has sent us here so that you'll taste more of god's power and by the time you go back by the grace of god you will demonstrate the supremacy of god in jesus name number four is there not a cause for david being there he was there to become an instrument of strengthening the people of God. You know, the people of God, by the time David arrived, they were weak, they were feeble, they were afraid, they were trembling. Every time they saw that Goliath standing before them, defying the armies of Israel, and even defying the God of Israel, and he cursed them by his idol, by his God. And he challenged them to come and prove that the God of Israel is still as strong as before. He challenged them to come and choose a man that will be able to put him and his God and his idols. Now, every time he came to do that, the children of Israel trembled. And they ran away. Every time he came like this, they will beat themselves back. They will run back so that he will not even come near them. The children of Israel were weak. The people of God were weak. No courage again. No faith again. But then David came. Is there not a cause? Why David came at this time? I want to remind you that when eventually David killed Goliath. The children of Israel all of a sudden. Their fear fled away. Courage came back. They ran after the Philistines. And the Philistines were running away. And they all ran after them. David had changed the situation. You know why you are here see our people back at home i mean in your church location sometimes you'll find them they're like uh, the hens and the chicken when rain has beaten them and they're all folded and they're all afraid can we go to bible study can we go to revival hour can we come out on sunday can we go to house fellowship see them in their little groups as they are discussing as they are saying i had this i read this i don't know there's no job there is no food and here they are do you know that god has sent you here he will so energize you he will so empower you when you get back to the midst of those people that have been timid and afraid and a terror has stricken upon them when you just open your mouth like this, one syllable you pronounce coming from heaven will take, will break all their bands and all their chains. And they will come out again. And they will say, why were we ever afraid? When he that is within us is greater than he that is without. Why were we ever afraid? When those chariots of fire, chariots of angels of God around us are greater than all those Assyrians that we see. Why were we ever afraid when God is on our side? When you go back, you are going to be an instrument of strengthening the people of God. Number six, to prove the reason for the new anointing. You know, David in chapter 16 had received a new anointing. But then he went back to uh, what he was doing before taking care of the sheep and singing his psalms and playing his psalm he had been doing all that before he was anointed and he had not done any new thing after he had been anointed the only thing is that 
the location of his playing the harp had been changed a little bit. He had been playing the harp just by himself alone before the anointing. And then when Saul had this problem in chapter 16, he was then brought to the palace of the king to play the harp. It was still the same harp. It was still the same tune. It was still the same playing. Only that it was now in a different location. But now he needed to know that that new anointing is not for nothing. That new anointing, anointing is for a purpose. And then what purpose is it for? Remember, remember, in the heart of God, in the mind of God, I have found a man after my own heart. He was to come to lead the children of Israel. Which are the greatest enemies of the children of Israel? The Philistines. And God addressed him up to replace Saul. So that he will defeat the greatest enemies of the children of Israel. He didn't know that. And so God sent him there. To prove the reason for the new anointing. Now it may be that in your own region. Oh you see. I don't even know why I should come to the workers retreat. Because recently in our region. The Lord was so mercifully wonderful. That he poured a new anointing upon us. And it was in our revival time. Or it was in the Sunday fellowship. That our overseer, our pastor was preaching. And what I had been looking for for years. I got the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Or there was a new anointing upon my life. Uh, do I still need to go to the workers retreat? When in fact this is the very best time in my Christian life. The Lord has so done a wonderful thing in our region that I don't know that I even need any other thing. You know, the Lord has brought you here. Although you've got that anointing, although you've got that power, although you have got that breakthrough in prayer, He sends you here to prove the reason for that new anointing. Another reason, to lift God's name up from the mud, from the dirt, from the mire. You see, at that time, the name of the Lord for 40 days had been put in the mud. Every time Goliath came out, he joked with the name of God. He cursed with the name of God. He ridiculed the name of God. And the children of Israel, no preacher came out. No prophet came out. Nobody came out to defend that name of God. They were, they were all quiet. Their names were, their, their mouths were closed. But then when David came and he heard that man define the name of the God of Israel, something rose up within him that said, I won't take that. I'm going to challenge that man. I'm going to take that name from the mud, from the mire. I'm going to lift it up and I know that something is going to be done. Maybe in your own localities where you came from. You have heard the name of Christ put in the mud. The salvation of Christ ridiculed. And the Bible ridiculed. And church ridiculed. And everything pertaining to the God of heaven. Pertaining to Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer. You've seen that thing brought into the mire. And you have been saying, can we talk? In this situation, can we talk? Can we challenge these people? Can we say anything to each? Although I believe in Christ, I hold that to myself. Although I believe in Jesus, the Savior, who died for me on the cross, I hold that to myself. God sent you here. There is a cause. So that... There will be a renewed zeal within you. That when you go back. Anywhere the name of God is ridiculed. God will use you. You will lift that name up from the mire in Jesus name. Another reason. Is to testify. Of God's past goodness. And move to greater exploits. Is there not a cause there were testimonies that David had never told. There were testimonies that Saul never heard. There were testimonies that Israelites never knew. As that young man had been in the bush, in the forest, in the wilderness, taking care of the sheep. There were things he had never said. Who knew that this young man killed a lion? Nobody ever knew. 
Who knew that this young man killed a bear? Nobody ever knew. That testimony must come out. And in the plan of God, in the purpose of God, in the time of God, he brought David to that place so that that testimony that had never been told will be told to everybody. There is a testimony in your heart that has never been heard. There is a divine message in your mouth that has never been spoken. And there is an inspiration coming from without, coming from above, that had never flowed to the hearts of the other people that need to listen to you. The reason why you are here is that God will take those words in your mouth, that testimony in your heart, he'll bring it out to other people. David said, Eliab, what have I done now? Is there not a cause for being here? There are testimonies I need to give that have never been given. There are words I need to speak that have never been spoken. Eliab, do you want to silence that testimony? Do you want to seal those words up that they will never be spoken? Is there not a cause? You see, if you don't come to a meeting like this, a retreat like this, maybe there will be some testimonies that you will never give. Some words you never speak. Some inspiration within that never flow out into the hearts of other people that need to hear. Is there not a cause? Not only to give the testimony of killing a lion. But then to move from killing the lion to doing greater exploits and killing Goliath. The lion-like man. So then, is there not a cause for being here? Do you think that anything happens by accident? Do you think that you just took money? And you just came down south. And nothing will be the result. Something is going to happen. Your praying is going to cause something to happen. Your absolute surrender to the Lord is going to make something to happen. When that thing happens, it will benefit you. It will benefit your family. It will benefit the whole nation. It will go beyond this nation and benefit Africa. Not only that... Is there not a cause? He had come into victory and ministry that continues for life. Listen. Many things that many people do, they just do them at a moment of time. Those things do not continue for life. And David said, Is there not a cause? There is something that I've never done. And yet that thing is the very life for which I have the new anointing. That thing is what will continue till the very end. I am beginning history. What does that mean? Now you see, the Philistines had done a lot to Israel. In the battle, the two sons of Eli had died. Not only that, Eli, hearing that news, he dropped dead. Not only that, even when Saul had been chosen, the Philistines, they came against him and against Israel. And if you know anything about the history of Saul and Israel, Saul, facing the Philistines, died in battle eventually and his three sons but then israel did not have anyone if saul was failing i was going to fail i was going to fall eventually by the hands of the philistines who do we have in this whole nation of israel that will confront this continuous annual perennial battle from the Philistines against the children of Israel. Nobody knew. And they didn't know that there was a young man. That God himself had restored. And so David came to start something that will continue all through his life. And that will continue to the point that he will totally wreck, ruin, weaken those Philistines. And so he came. And the first battle he fought in his life. The first battle he engaged in was the battle against the Philistines. And then for the rest of his life, 
he continued fighting that battle. Before now, he might have been doing things, but the thing that the Lord wants you to do to defeat Satan and the demons. You know, some people say, I've never cast out devil. I'm born again. I'm sanctified. And I'm even baptized in the Holy Ghost. Who knows that you are here at such a time like this to start that thing to continue it for the rest of your life. Some people say, you know, I've never prayed for the sick. I believe in healing. I believe God can heal. I believe that when Jesus said, this sign shall follow them that believe. I know that I'm a believer and this sign shall follow me. But anytime they say somebody is sick and they say, pray for him, I come back. I give chance to other people. If they say, teach the scripture, I go forward. If they say, answer a question from the Bible, I run forward. If they say, lay hands on the sick, I take some steps back so that other people can go forward. I've never done it. Some people say, do you know whether you are here at such a time like this? So that the power will come upon you. The anointing will come upon you. That when you leave this place, you'll be looking for where are the sick people. You'll be looking for where are the demonized people. And then they said, there is somebody here, he is incurable. There is somebody here, medicine hospital cannot, uh, cannot do anything about it. You say, is that the one I'm going to start with? And the Spirit of God says, yes, that's the reason you're going to Lagos. And then you go there, you say, in the name of Jesus, I command you sickness. Get out before you finish your sentence. The man jumps up. You say, what? So I can kill Goliath? That's the reason you came. Is there not a cause? And when you begin it like that, after you've gone back to your region, you've gone back to your uh, locality, when you begin it like that, you are going to continue it for the rest of your life. <laughs> to have victory and to begin a ministry that continues for life. Well, another reason why he was there, when he said, is there not a cause? It was to change history and the destiny of the defeated. You see, God is interested in the poor and the oppressed and the defeated and the discouraged. God takes special interest in the people that have no strength, in the people that have no ability at all. And the Lord has sent you here so that by the grace of God, when you leave this place, you will change the history of many people. You will change the destiny of many lives in Jesus' name. Listen to me. Watch if. David had not come. What if Elab was there? All the others were there. King Saul was there. What if Goliath was allowed to continue bragging like that? And to then defeat the children of Israel. That they will be under oppression for many years. The history of the children of Israel would not have been what we have read. But somebody came to change history. Don't you know? In your own family, they say, this happened to great-grandfather, and it happened to grandfather, and it happened to father. I think now you have come into the kingdom to change that history. Or they say, this is what happened in this tribe, and in that tribe, and in that tribe. And all of us, they have been saying, well, don't expect to be victorious, because don't you know the, uh, the story of your tribe? And then they tell you a little story. They say there was upon, once upon a time that they uh, went against uh, these people in your tribe and they defeated them. And you were born in that situation. Then your uh, people will call you. They will say, are you not thinking at all? What's the first name, the native name of your father? Then you mention it. They say, why is it that your father didn't like people calling him by that name? You say, uh-huh, now I understand. You know the meaning of that name? Uh-huh. That's the reason why he didn't want that name. But whether he wanted it or not, that's why the family is always defeated. And you are here to change that history. To change that destiny. Somebody has to rise up. Somebody has to come. Somebody has to emerge. To change the history of many people that are defeated in life. And we have come. We have come. 
and we come to change history, many lives are going to be affected by this retreat. Many tribes are going to be affected by this retreat. Many people who have been struggling with the devil and demons and they're defeated in life, they are going to be affected by your life in Jesus' name. Like David, we have come. And when you see a lot of people like this, like the salt of the earth, scattered all over in those places you have come from, history will change. Destinies of people will change. Not only that, it is to weaken the enemy and keep that enemy perpetually, permanently under. From that time, anytime they had the name of David, the Philistines will run away. And you know from this time on, that's the reason we came. Why? After we've been Christians all these years, five years, ten years, twelve years, fifteen years, the devil will hear your name and say, who is that? I don't know him. After fifteen years of being a Christian. And the demons will hear your name and say, who is that? I don't know him. I know Paul. I know Jesus. I know David because he gave me a showdown. But then, I don't know so and so. From this time, he will know. Because the reason for coming is that the power of God will so much come upon your life so that the enemy will be weakened permanently, perpetually in Jesus' name. But then, I go to point number two. Divine provision through absolute surrender. Divine provision through absolute surrender. You know, God works in such a way that whatever he's going to provide, whatever he's going to do, it takes a part from you. It takes yieldedness, surrender from you. Some people wonder, why is it that we don't see God doing things like he used to do in days gone by? Oh, the reason is because men have changed. On the side of God, God has not changed. On the side of God, he remains ever the same. But he is looking for the people that are absolutely surrendered unto him. Here, David was called by his father. And then his father told him, he said, David, leave the sheep and then go now and do this. What if he had said... I'm not confident of anybody to leave the sheep in his hands. What if he had said, I never thought of that before. And since it didn't come to my mind, I don't like obeying sheepishly, blindly. What if he had said, I'm getting older now. When I was very young, daddy used to call me and I'll say, go there without any question, I go. And then he will say, come back without any question, I will come back. But now, I'm getting older. In fact, apart from getting older, I have killed a lion. I have killed a bear. And should somebody who has killed a lion, who has killed a bear, continue to obey daddy the way he used to obey before, I think now that if you don't recognize that I'm now an adult, I'm now an adult, he could have said that. Not only that, he could have said, I'm now only under the control of God. Because when Samuel came to our family, Daddy, didn't you see, when you brought my senior brothers, and they were all rejected, and uh, when I came, then the Spirit of God said that as the young man arise and anoint him. I even had that before I came. Samuel said, send for the youngest one of them all. We're not going to start doing anything until he comes. And when I came, the Spirit of the Lord said, that is the man. A man that has been approved of God like that. How should I just say yes, sir, to my daddy? I'm now a man of my own idea. Or he could have said, when um, the Jesus said, now go and see your brother and give these unto them. He could have looked down those brothers and said, which brothers? The brothers that were rejected by God. The brothers that God said, Samuel, it is, that is not the man. Because God does not see as man seeth. David could have had all those excuses for his disobedience. He could even have said, the anointing is now upon me. And because of the anointing that is now upon me, 
I've been to the palace, and when I played the harp, the evil spirit departed from Saul. Which of those, my brothers, were able to do that? For me to run errand and go to them, no, I will not do that. Do you know that sometimes we limit the power of God in our lives because of the excuses we give? We say, I've been now five years in this church. It's not like before when our local pastor will just call me and say, join the choir, and I will not say anything. I'll just go and join the choir. It's not like before when, uh, when I was uh, younger in the church, that the uh, pastor, local pastor will just call me and say, "Go, we need you among the ushers. It's not like before when the pastor will just call me and say, in this coming retreat, uh, you will cook in the kitchen, you'll be among those who will be sweeping the floor, you'll be among the sanitation workers. Ah, uh, it's not like, because you know, now I am saved and sanctified and baptized and anointed and I can give you testimonies of what happened in my house fellowship and in my zone. Therefore, nobody can control me like before. If David had said that, how would he have done what he did in killing Goliath? You know what is our problem? Our problem is that many times we are not absolutely surrendered unto the Lord. If you will change, your situation will change. If you will change, all your defeats will be turned into victory in Jesus' name. God is still looking for that absolute surrender, absolute yieldedness that will say, no matter what I've got, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've received, no matter the new name and the new anointing and the new power that I've got, I'm going to be submissive to leadership and to the hands of the Lord. The Lord is going to use you in a mighty way in Jesus' name. You know, it's the Almighty actually that used Jesse to tell him to go to the battlefield. We, did, we wouldn't have known that except he had obeyed. You wouldn't have known that when Jesse called him, it was not just Jesse. Behind Jesse, above Jesse, within Jesse, was that voice of God, the still small voice, telling Jesse, send him out now. Send him out now. Send him to that place now. Although he did not send him as a warrior. He sent him as a visitor. And yet, when he got there, the role, the title changed from being a visitor and observer to being a person that was involved, that was victorious, the one that actually took the messenger of the devil on and defeated him. And the Almighty, the limitless one, the omnipotent one, is the one that has called you. He may use your pastor. He may use your leader to tell you his word and to tell you his will. And of course, in this uh, retreat, he's going to use many preachers to tell us his mind. I pray we will obey. Because it is that absolute surrender, absolute yieldedness, unquestioning obedience to the Lord, a kind of obedience, a kind of yieldedness, that will not argue. It is that the Lord is looking for. That he will use in your life. And make you and provide through you. The conqueror and the warrior. That we need in this generation. In the name of the Lord. Well. I could have given you. Many other references. Of the same thing. Of how. The Lord used situations. That appear to be orchestrated by men. And yet, the Lord used those situations and then he brought the victory that he wanted to bring. It's a long um, passage in Second Kings chapter 2. So I just say it to you. Second Kings chapter 2, from verse 1 all through to verse 15. Do you know that Elijah told Elisha, he said, Elisha, don't take the trouble. You stay here. For the Lord hath sent me to another place. And Elisha said, Trouble, I'll take the trouble. I'll go with you. As the Lord lives, as, the, as your soul lives as well, nothing will patch myself and yourself. And they went over. When he got there, Elijah called him again, and he said, The Lord has sent me to another place. And you know, 
when they got to where he first said, the Lord had sent him, he didn't preach there. They didn't hold crusade there. They didn't visit anybody there. They didn't do anything there at all. Elisha should have been thinking, if, if, if Elisha were like you and like me, but, Master, you said the Lord sent you to Gilgal. No sacrifice, no prophesying, no service held, nothing done at all. Oh yes, the Lord sent me. And now, even though we have reached Gilgal and there is nothing we have done, the Lord has sent me to Bethel again. Well, if the Lord is sending you to a place where there is no preaching, there is no prophesying, there is no sacrifice, and there is nothing at all, no service, no crusade, I think I better stay here. Instead of doing this merry-go-round for nothing. Oh, he said, the Lord has sent you there. I'll go with you. We didn't do anything here. We didn't achieve anything here. We didn't accomplish anything there. I'll go with you. And they go to the next place. You'll be surprised. He didn't gather a crowd. He didn't stage a crusade. He didn't get anything done at all. And then he said, Elisha, you know what? The Lord has sent me also to go to another place again. This is Jericho. We're going together. Why? That man was an adult. Elisha was a manager of his farming corporation before Elijah met him. How could you be taking a director, a manager, a person that had all those uh, oxen? How could you be taking a man like that from place to place without doing anything? If it were today, Elisha would have been questioning, how is this man just going from place to place saying, the Lord has sent me, the Lord has sent me. Before I came to know him, and before I knew the Lord this way, I used to be a manager. And if I said we're going to a particular place, it's either we're going to have a conference there, a consultation there, or we're going to have a contract there, we're going to do something there. How is the Lord sending my master to this place and this place? And there was nothing. Elisha did not have any question. And then they came to uh, uh, Jericho, and then he said the Lord has sent... Uh, uh, but... Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho. Nothing was done. Nothing was accomplished. The Lord has sent me. He never argued. I'm telling you that this absolute surrender is what will bring power of God into your life. The life that will follow. Follow the word of God sheepishly and blindly and that will not question. And then when he got to the uh, Jordan, the sea was overflowing. And they couldn't just wait through. They couldn't just walk through. Now at that time, you would have thought Eli Elijah, Elisha should have said, because Elisha knew the, the sons of the prophets had come to him and they had said, the Lord is going to take your master away from your head today. He should have thought, if I cross over with Elijah and the sea, the river comes back, how am I going to leave that place because over there there's no food, there's no accommodation beyond Jordan? How am I going to stay there and come back? He never thought about that. That man was, you know, in the language of the people who are abusing us today, he was foolish and fanatical. And if you are not foolish for Christ, you'll never accomplish anything for God. If you are never fanatical, the way the people are accusing us who are fanatical, you're not going to accomplish anything for the Lord. And so, Elisha wrapped up his mantle, and then he smote the water, and it parted, and they both went over. It was then, after that, Elijah said, Elisha, ask me what you want before I be taken away from you. Why didn't you tell me that in Gilgal? Absolute surrender is necessary first. Why didn't you tell me that in Bethel? Absolute surrender is necessary for us. Why didn't you tell me that at Jericho? Absolute surrender is necessary for us. Why didn't you tell me before we cross Jordan so that I will know what I would have got? I'll be able to come back uh, with uh, the power of God and divide Jordan. Absolute surrender is necessary for us. Before you know you'll have the power to cross Jordan, to divide Jordan, you'll first surrender yourself. After Elijah had seen him, that he had surrendered his life, his future, everything into the hands of God. Then he said, ask me now what you want, and then it will be given unto you. 
divine provision through absolute surrender. And then he said, what I want, I don't want cars, I don't want clothes, I don't want houses, I don't want friends, I don't want political title, I don't want chieftaincy title, I don't want a great name, I don't want a great image, I don't want any other thing except a double portion of the power I saw in you. That power that raised that child when the child was dead. That power that confronted Ahab when Ahab sold himself to do evil because his wife was uh, in, in influencing him. That power that was able to stop the heavens for three and a half years and there was no rain. That power that was able to confront those uh, Baal prophets. And then you said, you take your, blood, uh, your bullock and I will take my bullock. And the God that answers by fire, that will be the God we're going to serve. That God that made you to be able to go to the mount. And then you bend down, you pray seven times until the rain came. I want not just that power, I want a double portion of that power. And that takes absolute surrender. Before you can have that, and I know that's what you want. I said, I know that's what you want. You want a double portion of the power of God. Is it possible? Is it possible? I mean, with just, uh, you know, these three, four days, a day for Gilgal. Or three, four days, a day for Gilgal, a day for Bethel, a day for Jericho, a day for Jordan. These days where we are for you to go from Tuesday to Wednesday. And then maybe you say, I've not got it. To go from Wednesday to Thursday, you say, I've not got it. From Thursday to, uh, to uh, Friday, and you say, you've, and uh, from Friday to Saturday, you say, you've not got it. And bam, it comes upon you before you go on Saturday. I know it can happen in Jesus' name. But you know, with Elisha, there was absolute surrender. He said, I will not argue. I will not even discuss with these people that are asking me, do you know the Lord is going to take your master away? Do you know the Lord is going to take your master away? Keep your peace. Hold your tongue. This is not the time for chatting. This is not the time for being a talkative. This is not the time to gossip. This is not the time to tell a story. This is not the time to say, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? I'm here for business. I'm here for business. I'm not here to see you people. I'm not here to see you people. I am here for the double portion. How many of you are here for the double portion? And so Elijah said, you have asked God will bless you and give it to you. And uh, Eli Elijah said, you have asked for a hard thing. You have asked for a hard thing. But if you concentrate and you see me, when I'm taking away from you, then it will be so. Then he said, if not, I don't want to hear that if not. If not, I don't want to hear that if not. If not, it will not be so. But he said, I'm not concerned with that if not. Because I will see you. I will get that power. I will get that anointing. And I want you to make up your mind. It is when you surrender to the Lord. Do you remember that woman? That God had sent Elijah to. And he was gathering sticks. So that he will cook the last meal and eat and die with her son. And then Elijah came to him. And Elijah did not say, to start with, in the name of the Lord God of Israel. He just said, woman, although God had sent Elijah, and he had said, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. He didn't tell him that, did you, did you dream? Did you have vision? Did you see me before in your revelation? Elijah did not say that. Elijah just said, woman, let me have a cup of water there. A stranger that he never knew before. No good morning. No good afternoon. No how do you do. No what do you have at home. How are you feeling? What's your condition? Nothing like that at all. How can a preacher just come like this? And he didn't say what's your condition? Are you well? Are you alright? Have they paid your salary for some months now? How about your children? Is your wife okay? How about your husband? That husband that, uh, you know, was unfaithful and uh, left you. I see you come back now. Nothing at all. He just came without a good morning, a good afternoon and said, go and get me a cup of water. Have you ever seen that? We're talking about absolute surrender. And then the woman, 
without saying how a strange man like this, these religious prophets. So this is, how they, this is the way they confront people. They don't even have the common sense to first of all ask about your welfare. No questioning. And then, while she was going, hey, before you come, bring me a muscle of bread. I'm hungry. This man does not know that I'm a widow. Oh, she said, I do not have any cake. In fact, what I'm cooking now is to cook and eat and die. And then the man said, go and do as I've said. Not what you said, what I have said. For the Lord has said that that goose of oil will not fail. That barrel will not fail until the Lord will bring supply to the nation of Israel. And the woman went. He didn't, you know, it wasn't a one hour message. It wasn't a motivational message. There was no choir that sang a good song like the one they sang now, what a friend we have in Jesus. Before that message, it was just a dry message to a poor woman who was getting ready to die but with absolute surrender. She went and did like that. Divine provision came. That's what God wants you to do. When you don't argue. When you don't say, how can that be? Because it is going to be. I said it is going to be. Point number three is divine power through prevailing prayer. Divine power through prevailing prayer. That power will come. You know, when you think about prayer, it's a wonderful thing. As you look through the Bible, our hearts rejoice before the Lord because of the great possibilities of prevailing prayer. If you go through your Bible, Eliezer prayed for guidance in Isaac's marriage. And just before he finished the prayer like this, the person that I seek was to marry just appeared. Do you know that God still answers prayers like that today? Some people say, I have prayed for three years, for four years, for five years. Well, the prayer in this retreat will be different. It will be a prayer that like Eliezer, while he was praying for guidance like this, the lady came and then all the condition, conditions he gave, everything was fulfilled. And Abraham prayed for Sodom's preservation. Now can you think of a man? praying not just for himself not just for his son not just for his family but for Sodom a whole city and you can pray for a whole city too you know how Jacob prayed for Esau's heart to be softened and changed he settled it in prayer what people would have been sending people to you know, in fact he sent people he sent people to Esau he said uh, if he sees this and sees this Esau said go back and tell him that the 20 years enmity between us has not been forgotten. Tell him, I'm coming with 400 men. And those men, they shoot without missing. When Jacob heard, he told his people, the wife, the children, the servants, all the people go to the other side. And he stayed on this side alone. You know, during this time, it's going to take that seriousness in prayer. That you will stand on this side alone. When your friends from the same region. Or your friends from another region. But you are from the same state of origin. When they will come to you and say. Ah my brother. My sister. You say my brother my sister. I would have liked to discuss with you. But there is a Jacob need. That needs a Jacob prayer in my life. I need to be a Jabok. And I need to wrestle with that angel. And when you will do that, you will see that marvelous things will take place in your life in Jesus' name. And I prayed and a prophet was born. Do you know, when you pray in this retreat, you can never tell what will happen. Other people may pray and have children, just ordinary children. You can pray that a prophet can be born. Elijah prayed and three years farming stopped and rain came immediately. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel was sick. And Isaiah, that should pray for him. Isaiah, the prophet of God. Isaiah, that should have laid hands on him to say, in the name of the God of Israel, you are healed. The, the prophet of God did not come to pray for him. The prophet of God came to say, Ezekiah, I'm a prophet. You expect I will pray for you now as you are sick. The Lord told me to tell you to set your house in order because you will die. 
Ezekiel said, that's all the message you have brought. See my pain. You can't lay hands on me. You can't pray for me. God said, set your house in order. You are going to die. Ezekiel said, Isaiah, if that's all the message you have, thank you very much, bye. He turned his face to the wall. He said, God, what kind of message is this? I will not die. This sickness will not kill me. God, I've not finished my work. I am not going to die. And God said, Ezekiah, you can pray for yourself. Without even Isaiah laying hands upon you, Ezekiah, how many years will I give you? I have about 15 years addition to your life. He said, that's all right, God. I give you 15 years. Prayer. We can pray. I said, we can pray. And when you pray your life, everything will be changed in Jesus' name. Look at Jonah in a condition in which he found himself. He prayed. Look at Paul and Silas. They prayed in the prison. Look at even the thief on the cross. He was already hanging on the cross, about to die, about to go to hellfire. Then he uttered a sentence of prayer. Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus answered the prayer of the man. He was nailed to the cross like this. He couldn't turn his neck very well. The pains were very serious in the midst of that pain. He said, remember me. And God said, Christ said, I remember you. Today you will be with me in paradise. You are not hanging on the cross. Nobody is nailing you. You don't have any pains like the pain on the cross. If they can pray, you can pray. Can you pray? Rise up and show you can pray. And you talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, this is what I want. I came so that I'll be saved, I'll be sanctified, I'll be baptized. You know, the Holy Ghost, the power of God will be upon my life. And this retreat will be a time of prayer. This retreat will be a time of prayer. This retreat will be a time of prayer. The Lord wants us to pray in this retreat. It is that prevailing prayer that will bring divine power into your life. Is there anything that needs to be changed in your life? Anything that needs to be changed in your family? Anything that needs to be changed in your circumstances? Anything that needs to be changed in your region? Anything that needs to be changed in your very heart? Anything that needs to be changed in your very life? We can pray. We can pray. We can pray. And the Lord will do it. And the Lord will do it. And the Lord will do it. We came here to pray. We came here to call upon the name of the Lord. We came here so that impossibilities will become possible in our lives. There will be absolute surrender before the Lord. Absolute surrender before the Lord. Absolute surrender before the Lord. No argument against His word. No argument against His word. Total obedience. Complete yieldedness, absolute surrender in the hand of the Lord.
Only then will the Lord be able to bless us. Only then will the Lord be able to bless us. Only then will the Lord be able to bless us. You are here for a purpose. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason why God has brought you here? Is there not a cause? Is there not a purpose why you are here? Yield yourself to the Lord so that that purpose will be fulfilled. Commit yourself to the Lord so that that purpose will be fulfilled. If you have not been saved, you need to be saved. If you have not been sanctified, you need to be sanctified. If you have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. If you are not fully yielded to the call of God in your life, you need to be fully yielded to the call of God. If you have not been absolutely surrendered into the hands of the Lord, that full consecration, that total consecration, that absolute surrender will need to come in your life. Then there will be divine provision. Then there will be divine power. When then will divine purpose be fulfilled in your life? Look up to God and God alone. Don't look at your circumstances. God will change them. Look unto God alone. It is at the point of absolute surrender that the Lord will begin to walk in your life. It's at that point of full consecration unto God that God will begin to do the extraordinary in your life. You are here for a purpose. Let that purpose be fulfilled. in the name of your son Jesus we thank you because of the human arrangements that has brought us here Lord there is a cause there is a purpose there is a reason why we are here at such a time like this Lord there is a reason why we are in the kingdom for such a time as this and Lord we are here to tell from you to learn from you where we are here. And Lord, I am praying that nothing around us, nothing anywhere will hinder us from learning from you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we are here, all you want us to see 
All we must know why we are here, Father, reveal unto us. Lord, show unto us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, all the absolute surrender, all we need to do, all the yieldedness that belongs unto us, that must be our portion to receive from you and to know your will. Give us the grace to yield unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, in us, we want to see your spirit moving. In us, we want to see your spirit touching us. Lord, in us, we want to see ourselves yielding unto you, yielding unto leadership, and doing your will from our hearts in Jesus name Amen. O Lord in us there will be no argument in us there will be no rebellion in us you will find us yielded you will find us obedient you will find us submissive following after you in the name of Jesus Christ Amen. and Lord all the promises all the blessings that you have promised unto those who are yielded unto you, unto all who walk by your word. Lord, as we are here, bring these blessings upon us and let your blessings overtake us in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm praying that in this place, more than ever before, the Spirit of God that makes us pray. The Spirit of God that brings God's blessings. Pour upon us in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, as we are going from here, we are going from here changed persons. We are going from here empowered by you. We are going from here as miracle workers. We are going from here filled with your power and able to do Greatness in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, even our people, even our parents, they will know. Indeed, there is a cause. There is a reason why we have to be here at this time. Lord, I pray again, whatever is around us, whatever is near us, whatever we are hearing, let us insist that we shall learn from God. We shall hear from God. We shall understand from God the reason why we are here. And Lord, as you show unto us this reason, help us, Lord, to fit into your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, to fulfill in us the purpose for our calling. Lord, by your grace, we will not fail you. By your grace, Lord, we are following after you. By your grace, Lord, in this life, we are going to walk with you, our hands upon the plow, Lord, and for us, there's no looking back. Thank you, Father, because you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.